Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jackson. I'm the founder of The Nurse Break, and with me on your right is Gail Smith, an Auslan interpreter based in Queensland and also an advocate for the deaf. Um, tonight, we are pretty much going to be doing something a bit different. Normally, we do live Q&As and we interview people's careers. Tonight, I'm pretty much going to hand, hand it over to Gail. She's going to run a class on how do we care for patients who are deaf and and can't communicate in ways that we we would assume many other people can. Um, she's done some amazing things. I think she's just um, had an interview with the ABC today as well, so she might want to tell you about all that as well. But um, before I might just hand it over. I'm going to stay on the right-hand screen. I'm going to put Gail as the main person. What I would suggest is everyone who's watching, and there's already 33 people, is any questions regarding anything to do with deaf people, sign language, um, all that sort of stuff, literally in the comments, type them and I can pop them on screen. So as we go along, if, some, if you have a question or something, <clears throat> um, just type them in the comments. And uh, yeah, cool. I'll hand it over to Gail. Hey, thanks, Jackson. Hi, everybody. My name's Gail. Just a little bit of a background about me. Um, I'm a sign language interpreter and an advocate, but I come from a family of 32 deaf people. So my parents are deaf, my grandparents are deaf, my daughter, my aunties, my uncles, my cousins, my granddaughter and my little French bulldog pup is also deaf. Um, I have been a really strong advocate, obviously, for deaf people in medical settings because I work in medical settings as an interpreter and I see the barriers that we have um, for deaf people. So I wanted to talk to you guys because you guys, the nurses, are the ones that work on the ground with these deaf people and I want their experiences to be much more um, accessible than what they have been as of late, especially the last couple of months. So yeah, I did do an interview this morning with ABC um, and there's another interview tomorrow with another uh, radio program and we also had a news story on Monday night. But let's ask some questions, ask me questions or I'm going to I'm going to ask you some questions. If you have a deaf client or a deaf patient come into the hospital that uses sign language, what do you assume or what's the best way to communicate? Jackson, are they going to be able to put questions up? Yeah, guys. So um, again, I'll ask some questions. Just type them in the comments. It might take a bit of time for people to comment, but um, if you just want to continue, I'll just pop them up as they come along. Sure. What was the so question again? So I'll type it up on the screen. So my, my first question or my first, um, I'm going to talk about what is Auslan? What is Auslan? So Auslan is Australian Sign Language used by the majority of deaf people in Australia. Um, it's a unique language just to Australia. So obviously in England, uh, America and all other countries around the world that have a different sign language. It has its own grammar and vocab. Uh, it doesn't follow English structure. So what I mean by that is if you're a person standing beside me and you're speaking and you're saying the cow jumped over the moon, I would sign moon cow jumped so the grammatical structure is more like french so hence we get the question well why can't deaf people just read and write they can read and write but their comprehension of english is as their second language makes it much more of a barrier and usually their education has been pretty poor and their literacy levels are quite low so auslan is the australian sign language so the aus australian sign language all right, next question. What have we got? How do I book a sign language interpreter? Very good question. When it comes to public hospitals, it is the responsibility of the hospitals to provide the interpreter. They have their own funding and they have their own process. I can only speak about what happens in Queensland because it's different in each state. But in Queensland, there are six contracts with interpreting agencies that provide interpreters. But unfortunately, four of those don't provide sign language interpreters. They only provide interpreters for spoken language over the phone. Hence, that doesn't support our patients that are deaf. The other two, which is Auslan Connections and On Call, but they struggle to provide interpreters and I won't go into much detail about that because I don't have much positive to say. Um, but what's supposed to happen is when the deaf patient presents to the hospital, they're supposed to inform you that they need an interpreter. It's pretty obvious when you see a deaf person and they can't speak and they're using their hands that they're deaf. So it wouldn't, 
would probably make sense if you said, do you need an interpreter? Most deaf people have been asking for interpreters and sometimes they ask so many times in their appointment and they just get ignored. So if you see a deaf person saying, can you call an interpreter? Please call an interpreter or I need an interpreter. They're asking for someone to come and relay that information in sign language for them. Um, so to book an interpreter, you're supposed to go through whatever the hospital's policies and procedures are. But Queensland Health just gave a statement the other day to ABC to say that they provide interpreters 24-7 at no cost to the client. But that isn't true and that hasn't been happening. Um, and we've I've been in the hospitals by the bedside with people in the last month and we had four cases in Ipswich last week. We've had cases at the Gold Coast just the other night, Sunshine Coast University Hospital, Royal, Royal Women's Hospital. There's been so many cases and lots of people from interstate contacting me as well. So to book an interpreter, you're supposed to follow your procedures. You've got to do it as soon as possible. You know, it would be really, really helpful if... Um, when that, an ambulance picks up a deaf client, that they could call through the hospital and ask you to book an interpreter as soon as possible. Because how do you assess a patient when you can't communicate with them? So you get someone, like I'll tell you a true story, but we won't um, say names. A young man, um, quite fit, had hurt himself at work that day. Um, he's a concreter. He'd hurt his back. He thought he'd be okay. He went to play netball that night and his whole team of netball, um, the people that were playing his team were all deaf. Uh, he hurt his back when he fell to the ground and couldn't get up. He was paralysed from the waist down. So he, they called an ambulance, but he can't communicate with the ambulance. But also remember, he's in pain, he's shocked, he's scared. He can't communicate, which causes another fear. But he's from his legs or from his waist down, he was paralyzed and he thought he would never walk again. So the ambulance arrived. He didn't know what to do. He calls me. So I'm video, like I'm on a video call with him, you know, talking to him, telling him what to do. They're taking him to the hospital. They get, and I've asked Queensland Ambulance to please call the hospital and get an interpreter there so that when he comes, they can assess him. They couldn't do it. They had to wait for the client to get to the hospital to get assessed first. So he arrives to the hospital stressed out, can't communicate, um, in shock, and we had to wait for hours for an interpreter to arrive. You actually can't give someone medication unless you've asked the questions whether they're allergic to it or not. And they were just giving him everything they could possibly give him without actually communicating with him. It was quite traumatic. So. Yeah, you've just got to follow the process to book an interpreter. All right. I can't see these questions. Yeah, so I've got a question off that. So what what would you say for healthcare workers? What would they do in an, in an emergency? In an emergency, it's difficult because, you know, you, you, can't, you can't predict. You, you know, it's harder to get interpreters after hours at 2 o'clock in the morning. But also we can't say to deaf people don't have a car accident after hours because it's harder. Um, so... I would just make sure that the people in the emergency department are aware of how to book an interpreter and get on the phone and book an interpreter as soon as possible. You can't rely on them to bring in their family and friends because they're not qualified interpreters and mm. there are policies and procedures around that. So, yeah, just get on the phone, make the call. Obviously, it's difficult to get face-to-face -face interpreters and there is a massive um, shortage of interpreters in Australia now due to the NDIS, which has caused quite a few problems. Um, so just get on the phone, make the call, and if you can't get someone there face-to-face, -face, even if you're in a remote area, um, they do have VRI, which is Video Remote Interpreting. So they so, can get So what is VRI and, I guess, how? what are the, some of the pros and cons and how can nurses, especially I'm thinking rural and remote, I'm thinking um, even community and aged care settings? Yeah. So VRI means Video Remote Interpreting. So what you normally do is um, they can use platforms such as Messenger, FaceTime, uh, Zoom, Teams, Skype. Um, so what will happen is the client will call, um, the, the hospital will contact and organise the um, hospital to get an interpreter on the screen. Um, <laughs> there was a situation today in Gladstone Hospital. Uh, they had an interpreter on the screen and um, it was quite funny because the doctor had his mask on. So with his mask on, the interpreter couldn't really hear. 
so the interpreter couldn't really hear what the doctor was actually saying and he kept leaning in front of the screen so the deaf client couldn't see the screen and it took them over four and a half hours to set up VRI. That's four and a half hours of clients sitting there waiting and it's a lot of wasted time for these nurses when they could actually be doing something more beneficial. So they really need to know what the process is on how to set it up. Um, another one of the problems is with technology, especially in the hospitals, I found that the Wi-Fi is very poor, so it freezes. So when you've got the interpreter signing and we need you to sign our consent form for an it freezes and so the deaf client's like um hang on i've got to sign a consent mm. form for what and yeah. you know and it always happens at the most crucial moment when the deaf person wants that information so it's kind of frustrating for them um and yeah unfortunately in hospitals the wi-fi is always quite weak the signal even if you connect to the hospital's wi-fi that's this is really interesting um sand just um has just posted a comment saying is there an app we can use in the interim, especially if we are in an area where interpreters are not available or VRI is not available? Good question. Yeah, it is a great question. That would be something that um, would be really good to put together in the future. But at the moment, there's no app. Most of the deaf preferred way of communicating through um, their phone is through uh, Facebook um, Messenger, uh, FaceTime. Um, but the problem is that we need to contact the interpreting agency that has a contract. So I work as an interpreter and I'm qualified, but the deaf clients are not supposed to contact me because I'm not registered or on the books of this interpreting agency. So therefore mm. I can't be used, but I am all the time, um, but I don't get paid for it. So um, is there an app we could use in the interim? Yeah. What a lot of deaf clients are doing now is they're taking ownership and they're taking control and they're making the choices. Now, MDIS is not supposed to pay for interpreters within the private settings, uh, through, through the public hospital, sorry, only through the private. But they're not going to lay there in a hospital in excruciating pain and confused and not know what's going on and being rushed into a hospital um, surgery in 15 minutes' time. So what they'll do is they will call an interpreter like myself and then they will um, say that they'll pay us through their NDIS, but that's not what's supposed to be happening. Queensland Health is supposed to be responsible or the, the hospitals. So can I ask, so an interpreter gets contacted, um, what actually happens next? So I'm the nurse, I've got a patient who I who is deaf and they need an interpreter, I call, I call the hotline, they put me through to an interpreter if they've got one, an Auslan interpreter, what's literally what happens next? So then what will happen is on the screen, if the hospital has the equipment, some hospitals aren't equipped yet, um, you will see an interpreter, just like you'll see me. And they'll usually wear black because when you sign, it makes your hands more clear. So, um, so just to interrupt, so what do you mean on a screen? So I'm just thinking in an emergency cubicle on a ward bed, there's no screens there. So are we calling on our smartphones ourselves as, as the bedside nurse or? Well, yeah, some hospitals are supposed to have uh, iPads set up on a screen on a trolley, but it's it's very rare, mm. I very Never rarely. So what they're doing now is they're telling clients to call up on their own phones. So they have to use their own phone and their own Wi-Fi to connect to it. And then, so basically it'll be like, but the, the worst thing is when they're laying down on the bed and they're in a lot of pain and they've got all these people standing around them, it's so hard to hold this up in, in front of their face and use their hands to sign. So they, and you need to use two hands to sign. So it's really mm. difficult, mm. it freezes. But look, it's not, it's not um, perfect, but it's better than nothing sometimes. Mm. Sometimes, but, but then sometimes it's actually worse than, than nothing because it's more frustrating. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, we can probably go into some of your experiences and stories of some of the things you've seen, which I'd be really interested to hear about. I've just had a question coming from Maddie. So everyone who's watching, there's like 40 plus of you. Amazing. Post in the comments any question you have. We'll pop them up. So Maddie's just asked, I once cared for a deaf, sorry, stated, I once cared for a deaf and blind patient through tactile Auslan. Was well, very interesting. Just took longer to communicate. So what is tactile Auslan? Okay, so usually tactile Auslan is where your hand goes on their hand and you use your hand to use their hand as like the paper. So with sign language, you've got like your hands that you communicate with and someone's looking at you. But when they're deaf blind, they obviously can't see you. So you grab their hand and you sign onto their hand. So yeah, 
It is very interesting. I love working with um, deaf blind. There's quite a few deaf blind here um, on the north side of Brisbane. Um, but yeah, it's just where you use their hand and then you sort of push to them. So you're basically your one hand and their one hand becomes the hands to use um, for sign language. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we've had another question come in. Thanks, guys. Keep posting them. Um, Jackie's just said, would it be beneficial for nurses to learn basic Auslan, like common phrases? Jackie, yes, I think it would be. And luckily tonight, we can, Gail is going to go through some of those simple phrases, but I agree with, and maybe we'll even do some other Q&As like this later in, in the year. But yeah, I think it would be interesting to embed this within university education. I think it is almost beyond necessary to have this. Uh, it just, yeah, I think that's a great question. It is a great question. And yes, yes, absolutely. You know, um, for you to be able to say, hello, my name is Jackie. I'm your nurse. I'm here to help you. Just that little phrase makes that deaf person, you can see in their face, oh, okay, they're going to mm. understand me as much as they possibly can. They've got patience. Um, so yeah, common phrases, and I am going to teach you some tonight. And I was talking to Jackson before that um, I'm going to try and find a platform where um, I can work with you guys to teach you for free um, every week for an hour. And we'll try and work it somehow that we can record it so that you don't have to be watching it while I'm doing it live. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember not so long ago a deaf guy was going in to have surgery and the anaesthetic doctor came in and he just said, hi, how are you? My name is Brad. And the deaf guy is like, oh, cool, how do you know sign language? And he's like, whoa, 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 that's all I know. But just that one phrase made him feel like they had that connection and you could see the smile on his face. And he learned that when he went to uh, Boy Scouts when he was a kid. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't replace an interpreted, but it doesn't mean that because a nurse knows some basic signs that it replaces an interpreter. You still need to book an interpreter. But it just makes that connection between you and the patient and the patient's experience so much more comfortable. And a follow-on question from this is from Ellie, which is great. I know my alphabet and basic phrases, but would my understanding, would if understanding was achieved between me as a nurse and patient? So effectively she's asking, does her basic understanding of the alphabet and basic phrases, would this be enough to gain consent from a patient or does it need to be an official interpreter? Yeah, that's pretty risky because one of the things that deaf people do is the deaf nod. They just nod and they have no idea what you're talking about. My parents are both deaf. My dad's the worst to do it. Um, so, yeah, look, basic alphabet and basic phrases is great, but reading back what they're saying, um, yeah, I wouldn't use that enough to gain consent because the client really needs to know and you'll be putting yourself at a risk if something goes wrong. Um, yeah, I probably wouldn't be doing that. Hmm. Uh, thanks for the questions, guys. Navrel has said, I am deaf in New Auslan. It time ch challenges to the hospital needs staff. Learn sign language, Auslan. Um, great comment. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> um, Tony has said, I oh. have deafness. I don't like to be referred to as a deaf person, but I'm a person who has deafness. Okay. So let's explain that quickly. A lot of the um, hospitals call deaf people uh, um, hearing impaired. And if you speak to the wider deaf, uh, de general deaf community, they don't like the term hearing impaired because it sounds like something that's broken that needs to be fixed. So they prefer to be called deaf or hard of hearing. And like Tony's saying here, she's she has deafness, but she doesn't like to be referred to as deaf. Then there's deaf with a capital D. So deaf with a capital D is someone who identifies culturally and um, uses Auslan as their language and they're proud to be deaf. But some people um, are deaf but they're not, as part of the deaf community, they don't use sign language, so they, we would refer to them as hard of hearing. But we're trying mm. to abolish the term um, hearing impaired. It was like years ago we used to call deaf people deaf and dumb, and now you wouldn't call deaf people deaf and dumb. It's quite mm. effective. It's like a long time ago we used to call black people black, and now you wouldn't say that. Um, mm. So we use the terms deaf or hard of hearing. Mm. Jay Shree, thanks for commenting. Thank you so much, Gail. This is amazing. Rory has commented, 100% needs to be part of the training. Communication is the basis and foundation of what we do. Tony has said language is important too. Um, what else have we got here? 
we've got Nat- Natalia who says, I work in general practice. Access to interpreters of any type is sketchy at best. Um, great questions, comments. Claire said, thank you, Jackson and Gail, for this session. You're welcome. Um, yeah, did you have any other comments, Gail, in regards to those questions before we move on to the next bit? Um, no, not that I can think of. Great. Guys, anyone watching, honestly, there's like four, about 50 of you. Put your questions in. Things you've ever wanted to ask at someone who's deaf, anything, um, Gail will be able to answer them for you. I guess the next question we came up with, Gail, was um, how do I work with an Auslan interpreter? I think you've covered most of it. but Yeah, how do I work with an interpreter? Okay, it's strange. When you get an interpreter and you're the doctor or you're the nurse and you've got the deaf patient and the deaf patient is usually sitting opposite you, it depending, it depending if you're doing consult or what you're doing, but or the deaf person's laying in bed. The interpreter needs to position themselves in a place that can be seen that's out of the way from the nurses so they're not going to interfere with what you guys need to do. So that's the interpreter's role is to move or around the room so that the client is comfortable. But I've worked with um, one specialist doctor once. It was a consult. He was sitting at his desk. He was a bit precious and the deaf lady was sitting opposite him. And then I pull the chair around and I sit next to the doctor you know, have a little bit of distance because the client wants to look at the doctor or the nurse because they're the one that's giving them the information. They're the one that's going to save their lives or or is important to them. And then they'll glance at the doctor or the nurse and then they'll look at the interpreter. But if the interpreter sits beside them, the client has to sit there like this the whole time. And it's strange for the nurses or the doctors when the interpreters are the ones that the deaf person is looking at. And I've seen nurses go, no, hey, hey, look at me, look at me. And it's like, well, hang on, they can't hear you. So just get used to the fact that they're looking at me and I'm just signing. Um, Also, with an interpreter, we usually remain impartial. I haven't been sometimes because I've seen some things happening where I've just, I've had to do the cultural bridging. But basically, everything that the deaf person says in sign language, I voice to the to the nurse or whoever's in whoever the professional is. And then everything that the nurse says back, I do in sign language. So if the nurse goes, oh, my God, this woman's a pain in the butt, I sign that and I've seen that and I have to sign it. And they're like, what did you tell her? And I'm like, everything that gets said in this room that is an earshot I have to interpret to make mm-hmm. it accessible. Um, so how do I work with an interpreter? What else? Um, don't I worked with um, a deaf lady just the other day at the hospital and the nurse kept writing notes because she thought that it was better to write notes even though we are getting paid to be there as an interpreter and she kept going up with like a folder and holding it in front of the deaf lady's face to read it and kept blocking the interpreter like and so then I had to keep relocating or moving so that they could see me and it just makes it really awkward just work together so basically just speak at a normal pace everything that you say we sign everything that they sign back but also understand that I constantly, when a deaf person's agitated or frustrated, when they sign bigger, they're cranky or they're being more passionate about something and they're really trying to get the message across. So we have to match their tone. If they're signing really small, they're just talking really gently and they might be whispering, normal. But if they're signing bigger, they're more passionate about getting this information across to you. And if they're freaking out in a situation, they're going to be more passionate. So when us interpreters voice for them, it makes us sound like we're aggressive. And I had it just the other day. The nurse said to me, you're being aggressive. You're attacking me. And I was like, honey, I'm only telling you what the patient is saying. And she's getting frustrated because everything you're doing is creating barriers for her. So they can't think that us interpreters are the ones that we're just basically relaying what the, the client is saying. Mm. I'm curious, before we get into some assumptions that we want to sort of bust, um, can you sort of go into a bit more detail some of the stories of sort of some of the bad experiences or outcomes you've seen for deaf patients? Um, I guess, and we can use them as sort of learning lessons. Maybe just before we continue, there's a few comments. Natalie has asked, Good question. How do clients with deafness find visual aids? Example, description of procedures such as cervical screening. We use them for patients from communities other, so from CAOD backgrounds, um, C-A-L-D. Um, uh, would they be helpful? 
Yeah, they are slightly helpful. If you make everything visual, it makes it heaps easier. One of the questions that a lot of deaf people struggle with is what is your pain threshold out of 10? A really Oof. good interpreter, like, what does that mean? Because they're very literal. They Deaf people take everything very literally. So when you say what is your pain threshold out of 10, a good interpreter would say you pain terrible is a 10 so 10's down here but if you go right back along so you go 0 to 10 so 0 is nothing 5 is like half half and then they'll give you their score of what they um would i have seen some of the visual aids in the hospitals but they're not really that deaf friendly um they could be worked on but, you know, even little things like, I know this is probably a bad example, but it's the first one that comes to my mind, is um, the word colonoscopy. There is no sign for it. It's spelt. So it's C-O-L-O-N. So you're coming in to sign the consent for a colonoscopy. And they'll be like, uh, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. what is this about? So we as interpreters have to unpack it. We have to say, this sounds terrible, bum, camera, up, have a look if there's a tear or there's a lump, maybe cancer. We have to explain what the whole, we need to know just as much, well, not just as much as you nurses know, but we need to know what the procedures are and, and how they, and what, what they do. And uh, if we don't, like I, I would, did a job just recently and it was a Humphreys field test and it was to do with eyes. And I was like, Humphreys field test? I can sign that, Humphreys field test, but what does that mean? And then the client's going to be thinking the same thing. So then I will say, can you break that down and tell me what we've got to do? And then they'll tell you how they do the test. And the client's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. So, yeah, visual aids is good. Doing it as visually as possible, yes, um, but still explaining it. Yeah, um, and I apologise if my language is not the correct terminology. Tony has said, so nice to say clients with deafness rather than a deaf person. So I do apologise for um, that. And I guess that goes to the next question. Um Jay Cherie has asked, there really needs to be broad education within healthcare about the do's and don'ts for the patients and interpreters so that patients can feel safe. So I sort of want to, if you can answer that question, but then also touch on some of the language that we use. So is me saying a deaf person not, not the right thing to be saying? Um, I don't really know Tony and her background or her connections with the deaf community, but I do know the deaf community across Australia and they all know me because I've been a very strong advocate for a very long time. Um, the deaf community prefer to be called deaf, simply deaf. I have done, mm. if you go onto my Auslan Journey Facebook page, we do do polls all the time. And one of the polls we did in April for the NDIS was to show the different terminology. So there's uh, deaf, hard of hearing, hearing impaired, deaf mute, deaf and dumb, um, people living with a hearing loss. Um, and if you have a look at the poll on the Auslan Journey page, the majority, the highest score was deaf. And then D mm. with a capital, like deaf with a capital D, like I said, is one that identifies to be part of the community, uses Auslan, and they're, they're proud and um, of their culture. Mm. And Claire's just commented, so we'll get to the questions, but the comments are coming through. Is it helpful to have, this is, goes to the other question, Claire has said, is it helpful to have written information for a patient to supplement the conversation for after the interpreter leaves? Yes, it is, but you need to use words that they're going to understand because, like I said, the grammar is different. Um, you know, this has got nothing to do with medical, but just say, for example, if I was going to get a recipe book, there is no sign for ingredients and there is no sign for method. So if I was to say ingredients, I would fingerspell ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I would say, what do I need to gather to make whatever I'm going to make to eat? And method is M-E-T-H-O-D. That means nothing either. So I say, how do we do it? What do we do? What are the steps that we're going to take to do it? Um, so, yes, written information, definitely. Make sure that, um, like the other day I witnessed um, a nurse writing. She was trying her best to write down information, but it was quite small and her writing wasn't easy to read. And then the client um, asked for her to write it bigger and the nurse kind of got a little bit upset by that. Um, just write it clearly, but just um, it's kind of more like pigeon English, I suppose, just more simple drawing pictures like this lady that just had an operation just recently didn't understand what it was all about. So the doctor actually drew. Um, it was like if he could peel off all of the layers of skin and you could see all of the organs in the stomach and he drew it 
And that was really, really um, helpful. Um, and then, yeah, when, when a client is discharged, that's a massive concern. When a client is discharged, they get handed all this information um, and this one recently. So she went into hospital because when she swallowed food, the food wasn't going down the esophagus properly and it was getting stuck. So they wanted to do keyhole surgery just to open up and, and sort it out. Then they discharged her. The dietitian came in to talk to her about what her food requirement is for the next two weeks. And this is what the deaf person saw. How would you feel? You've just had an operation and then this dietitian's come in and they've got an important role and they just see these mouths, these lips moving and they, they go home. So this woman went home and she had it all in written English, but she felt uh, uncomfortable about asking somebody else to read it for her because she didn't have a lot of support because she was away from home. And um, six days later, she ended up back in hospital with a perforated stomach, almost mm -hmm. died in front of me um, after she was ignored from 9.30 at night till um, I think four o'clock in the morning, she contacted me. So. Mm -hmm. um, Write it down, but just make it sort of easier to read, more visual. Mm. Okay, right. so thanks for answering. Um, there's a few more comments going through, but I think we'll go to the next question. So I'd be keen for you to sort of delve into some of those other stories of poor outcomes and experiences you've okay. seen. All right. Well, it was just one on on Sunday morning, uh, Saturday morning. Uh, Saturday morning, I was asleep. Seven o'clock, I get a phone call, um, a deaf guy was at a party, um, he got a little bit upset, a little bit of alcohol involved, got into a, a fight, um, ambulance was called, police was called, police came and took him, no communication. So he was getting frustrated, very, very agitated because the police were talking to everybody else at the party about what had happened, but they weren't. And he said, can you please get an interpreter? I want an interpreter. I want to tell you my version of the story and what's upset me. And the police were just like, no, wait, wait, wait. And they were talking to everybody else to get the information. He didn't have a chance to tell what had happened. He got dumped at the Sunshine Coast University Hospital at four o'clock in the morning. So from 12.30 to four o'clock in the morning, no access to an interpreter. Uh, four o'clock in the morning, he got dumped at the hospital, sat there until seven o'clock in the morning and he was furious. Now he was suicidal. He had a lot of mental health issues stemming from being in this world of not being able to communicate. And this was just triggering him and making him worse. So his best friend who's also deaf, who can't read and write very well and who um, can't speak or hear at all, um, contacted me at seven o'clock in the morning and said, can you please help us out? So I have like a broken record pretty much. Like every time I get these calls, I say to the deaf person when I'm on the video call with them, take the phone to a nurse and I'll talk to them. So they take the phone up to a nurse and they go, oh, excuse me, um, can you have a look at this? And then I'll be on the phone and I'll say, hello, my name is Gail, I'm a sign language interpreter. Um, this client is deaf and requires a sign language interpreter. Can you follow the policies and procedures? Would you like me to step you through and give you the after hours number to book an interpreter, but you need to get an interpreter. When I did this the other day, the nurse goes, oh, it's okay, her friend here can do sign language. And I was like, yeah, her friend's deaf as well. And they're like, oh, it's all right. We'll kind of just like just sort of gesture a bit and we'll read and write. And I was like, this guy is suicidal and has just told me that when he gets out of here, he's going to kill his mother first and then himself. And they were like, oh, he'll be right. He'll be right. And I was like, no, he's asking for an interpreter. So in the end, we, we eventually got an interpreter for him, but it was done in 15 minutes and they sent him home. Then I yeah. sat with him that afternoon for five and a half hours and I've spent hours with him since trying to put things into place to get him the support and when you actually hear what his frustration and mental health issues are from it's just purely from being in this deaf world and not being able to communicate and express how he's feeling um look there's lots of stuff there was one um just recently, uh, a mum from Ipswich had a young deaf baby and, uh, I mean, sorry, mum's deaf, the baby's not. She's about 13, 14 months old um, and she's got problems with her glucose levels getting very low. Um, she has to feed her every four hours and do the prick to check, 
test the glucose levels um, every four hours. Um, anyway, she gave her, it was a late night feed, and then she noticed that the baby wasn't um, looking normal. So she lifted up her clothes to have a look, and she was really struggling to breathe. So they called an ambulance. Now, the whole process to call an ambulance is daunting and terrible for deaf people. They have to use an NRS. It took her like over 45 minutes just to get through to the ambulance. Mm. Um, anyway, they get to the hospital and mum and dad are both deaf and everyone's running around doing what they have to do, taking the child off, not even asking for consent from the parents, just writing a couple of notes and mum and dad's like well what's going on what's happening to our child and just nothing so they're sitting there in this with this fear and frustration and asking for interpreters asking for interpreters and it just wasn't happening then when they got sent home they were told right you need to, to test the baby's um sugar levels now if it goes less than four you've got to put this gel on her gums and then test her again in 15 minutes and then after 15 minutes if her um, sugar levels are still under four you need to jab her with this pen which she thought was an epi pen but it's not it's like a sugar a glucose sugar um like like a like an epi pen kind of a thing um and mum's like but i don't I, I don't really feel comfortable with this i want an interpreter to really explain it properly i don't understand and they went oh you'll be right go and see a gp so she gets sent home um there was a lady just the other day in hospital and she was 15, 20 minutes off dying, the one with the perforated stomach. And um, no interpreter. When they come in and they're just talking and she's just watching their mouths moving, um, it's just it, my, my way of explaining is how would you like it if you were in a foreign country? Like let's say let's go to China, you get hit by a bus, you're in a pretty bad way, you're in a lot of pain, you're allergic to lots of different medications. They take you to the hospital and everyone's speaking Chinese around you and they're throwing consent forms at you in Chinese. You, of course you're going to have to trust them, but of course you're freaking out. And the other problem with this woman is that she's very, very allergic to lots of different medications and she knows what she is allergic to because she's had some really bad reactions. She kept telling the doctors and the nurses that she was allergic to it and she was spelling it out, but because they couldn't understand... If they actually had looked at her history, they would have seen it. They gave her the medication in front of me. Within 15 minutes, she was throwing herself all over the bed and reacting and scratching. Mm -hmm. And then she just basically refused any pain treatment or any uh, medication because she was so scared that they were, they, she kept saying to me, they're going to kill me. I said, no, they're not. They're doing their best. But she's now left the hospital and she's going to get um, a tattoo on her arm with the list of the medication she's allergic to so that she's ever in that position again in an ambulance or the hospital that they don't give her the wrong medication. Um, Jay Shree's just said, these are really distressing stories. I cannot imagine how distressing it must be for the patients. Hmm. Well, it's one of the women, one of the women at the moment, she's just gone home to Gladstone, had to go to the hospital again today and it took them hours and hours and like, you're mortified at these stories. Like I haven't even told you some of the other stories. Like obviously I can't tell you some stories because I'm due to confidentiality um, and, and their privacy. But um, honestly, it's it's mind-blowing. You know, imagine being a mum. Like just recently um, my daughter uh, had a baby. My, my daughter's deaf and her partner's deaf and they went into hospital and obviously it was during um, covid the, the time with the coronavirus um so they were very limited to who they could allow into the room and she knew she was having this baby she wanted an interpreter she wanted her first experience of having this baby to be beautiful she didn't she's never had a baby before she doesn't know what to expect so we asked the hospital for an interpreter and they went oh we can't due to covid and i was like are you kidding you don't have a choice you need to have an interpreter in the room you can't expect someone that speaks a foreign language. You wouldn't do it to them. So let's not do it to this, my daughter. Anyway, they end up getting an interpreter in there. But um, it was a lot of a, a lot of fight to get an interpreter in there um, for my daughter. And yet they have a student nurse come into the room that was just sitting there and watching and observing. What's more important, a student nurse for the birth of a baby for a deaf woman or an interpreter to give her access to what's going on? Mm. There, yeah, there's quite a few... Um, Horrible stories. Wow. And I think, look, if you're willing to, we'll go to a few more. But, um, look, I was just going to ask you 
um, how do people call an ambulance? But I guess Rory has asked that already. He says, can you please outline the process for someone to call an ambulance who is deaf? How do they do it? And why did it take 45 minutes in your last story? Look, do me a favour. If you get time, Google NRS, which stands for National Relay Service. I get people contacting me all the time. A deaf person watched their house burn to the ground because it took that long to use the NRS process to get a fire a fire truck out there. Um, yeah. So NRS is basically a lot of deaf people can't use NRS at the moment unless you're registered. You had to be registered by April. Um, so a lot of people can't even access the service. Uh, it's a bit of a joke, actually. Let's go here. This is going to blow your mind. It blows mine. And I, I tell this story so many times, but no one does anything. If you all get your phones out now and just Google, how does a deaf person call emergency services? So we're talking police, fire, or ambulance. So at, usually a deaf person has to find a hearing person around and ask them to please make a call for me yet they can't communicate with that hearing person if they're a stranger and they don't know them very well, yet they, so they make the call. So what have you found there? If you've, you've Googled um, how does mm. a deaf person call emergency services, does it say use your TTY and dial 106? No, it says in an emergency people should call, should only ever call triple zero to request an ambulance if they have medical emergency. Call nurse on call on 1300 60, 60, 24. Wait, but you put in how does a deaf person? Oh, sorry. How does a deaf person? That would make sense. Wouldn't it? How does a deaf person call emergency services? And it first comes up is, yeah, emergency, the deaf society and people who are deaf or have a hearing or speech impairment can call emergency services. The National Relay Service, TTY, uses dial 106. How does, how does this work? I guess that's where you're going to go to next. Yeah. Mm. All right. Let me, let me see if I can find my TTY. Hang on. Yep. Guys, there's like 60 of you watching. That's amazing. And I think this is so important for everybody. So keep the questions coming. There's a heap. We'll get to all of them. All right. Remember the phones that we used to use that have like the big little cup thing, the big cups on it, and then you dial? Hmm. That's when you used a TTY. So I'm going to show you the most latest technology that deaf people use, and you're going to laugh. Wow. This is like dinosaur ages. So these two cups is where you put the phone into it. But do you know what? It doesn't work with a mobile phone and it doesn't have access to Wi-Fi. So what used to happen when I was a kid, mum and dad had a TTY. So they wanted to call, they wanted to call someone, but the other person they want to call has to have a TTY as well. So if they're calling the real estate or they're calling their doctors, they're not going to have a TTY. So it's usually only good to talk to your deaf friends who have a TTY. But a lot of deaf people couldn't afford the TTY because they were about $1,000 as opposed to back in the day, as opposed to just a regular phone that you could hire from Telstra. Um, so what happens is you type in the TTY what you want to say, and then they'll say, who do we want? What, who's the phone number that you want to call? Who do you want to be connected to? And you'll say, police, fire, or ambulance. So then I'll ring and then you have to type everything in the TTY and then there'll be an operator that will um, read out what you've said and then everything they hear, they will type back, which is like the National Relay Service. But these things, same thing. On my Auslan Journey uh, Facebook page, we did a poll of who owns a TTY and still uses it. And I think I'll have to find it. I'll, I'll find it and I'll share it with you. Um, no one owns a TTY anymore. They were outdated 20 years ago, yet Queensland Health and the government department still expecting people to use something that's so dinosaurish. So that is literally the only option available. Yeah, well, that's what they say. So what ends up yeah. happening, I get this is why I get so many phone calls at crazy hours of the night because people know that I will answer my phone. So that I get a phone call, FaceTime, I answer it. A deaf person's like, can you please call triple O, tell them that there's a fire here, this is the address. So then I usually have them on my iPad so I can see them signing to me and I'll be on the phone and everything they say in sign language and, and I'll just talk to them. So, hello, I'm an interpreter calling on behalf of this person. She's in this place at the moment. There's a house fire. And then they'll ask me all the questions. I'll ask the questions. They'll tell me and then we'll go through it. And that's the quickest way to do it. But it's it's not a service. I don't get paid for it. And I can't keep getting woken up all hours of the night as much as I would like to, to help people. 
Um, so the NRS is pretty poor. Like you need to have a look at what the deaf people say about it. It's um, yeah, it's, it's not really working. Crazy. Um, more comments coming through, guys. Keep them coming. No, we're almost mostly deaf are frustrated and fed up with hospital and GP need interpreting, but they're no interpreting because very short interpreting need more get biggest interpreting. Yeah, yeah so I think Narelle is actually um, a deaf person. I'm pretty sure that she's deaf because I think she's on my um, Auslan journey page. So what she's mm -hmm. saying, yeah, that people are getting really frustrated and fed up with the hospitals and that um, the GPs as well. Now, the GPs are private, so NDIS covers that. Queensland Health or the... The I say Queensland Health because I'm from Queensland, but the public hospitals are supposed to be provided for by the funding that they have within the public hospital, which is different. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are like the stories. Oh, the stories. Look, honestly, if you want to see some of the stories, join the Auslan Journey page. Don't say much. You just have to sit back as a nurse and just observe and just learn mm. the culture. Like, don't get in there and say much. You'll probably get attacked if you go in there and say something really, really silly because they they're very protective. Um, um, and, you know, we try to stay calm, but seriously, when when we just call sometimes, and I know this sounds terrible, but sometimes people go, oh, hearing people are so stupid. It's because they don't think outside the box and understand what it's like for them. And they, you know, we, we had a client the other day and um, the nurse said, oh, do you think your hearing will ever come back? And she's like, no, honey, I was born deaf and I'm 45. Why is it going to come back? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. You know, do you think it might just come back one day? It's like asking someone who's lost both their legs if their legs are going to grow back. Mm. Mind blowing. Elizabeth has just said, what a mess. We have such a long way to go with support and quality care for those with hearing impairments or cognitive impairments. Definitely an eye opener. Guys, look, I think if there's one thing for the 60 people who are watching this right now, that the, like for nurses or doctors or paramedics, whoever's watching, is like hopefully, hopefully, this can make you an advocate for patients who are deaf um, and speak up and advocate for them. Because I think that's really what we're just trying to do tonight by having Gail on is just to spread the word really. Um, another question is how long is an interpreter able to stay with a deaf patient? Our regional hospital waiting times can be several hours. Tests and scans take even longer. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, they got an interpreter in the Gladstone Hospital today for the first hour, but the doctors had no idea what was going on with this with Carol, who'd been at the Royal Women's Hospital. Um, there was no discharge papers that hadn't come through. It was just an absolute mess. Um, you know, the interpreters get paid by the hour, and they're not cheap. You know, they do that. They, they do get paid well, um, so they can stay with the client. But, yeah, sometimes they will have to wait for hours. They just don't have enough interpreters. Um, today it took them three and a half hours just to ring the other hospital in Brisbane to find out what was going on. And then when the interpreter, um, the interpreters kind of sit there and do nothing, you know, it's, it is really hard. With it, this lady that was in hospital just recently, Carol, um, I'd love you guys to meet her. She would love to tell you her story. And you'll see if you join, like I said, if you have a look at Auslan Journey page, she's posting up heaps of stuff because she's not being quiet. We had to call a Ryan's rule uh, for Carol when she was in hospital a few weeks ago because um, they kept doing things without her consent and um, I'd had enough. So I called a Ryan's rule for the very first time. And it was amazing how the whole dynamic of everything changed. Um, and if you're not sure what a Ryan's rule is, it's only in Queensland. It's basically where you call if you think that something's not happening properly. That's not. Um, so, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so we, I basically went to the hospital after work because a family begged me and I stayed from 7 at night when I got there till 12.30 and then I went back and stayed in a stranger's house which was the son of the deaf lady in Balmoral in this $5 million house but I felt like I was in a jail because I had nothing of my own. I had a massive headache. I couldn't access Panadol. My clothes were in their washing machine while I wore one of their T-shirts so I could go back to the hospital because I lived two hours away from the hospital. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. why do I do this for people? Like I should just say not my problem but I can't. Um, and then I went back to the hospital the next day from seven and stayed till seven at night. And even even just the, even just the little things are stressful for a deaf lady that's laying there. And someone opens up the door and says, "Would you like a cup of tea and some sandwiches?" But she's on liquid only. <laughs> and then the person's like, "Ah, uh, what? What did what did you say?" 
would you like to have a cup of tea and would you like some sandwiches for lunch? And the client's on, she's just had a perforated stomach. She's on a liquid diet. And she's like, by the time she worked out that she said sandwiches and I came back down, the client's like, are you serious? I put all that energy into trying to take that information. They should have known. They should mm. communicate with each other. Um, it is frustrating. Like I was in the hospital just recently and um, the interpreter said, I mean, the nurse said that they had actually called the interpreting agency and I was like, oh, I don't know, doesn't sit right with me. So I called in front of the nurse to the interpreting agency and they said they hadn't even had a phone call. Mm. And um, it just makes you mad when you're asking for something that's your human right and they just don't do it. But look, I'm looking at the time. I want to teach you some sign language. Do you want to learn some sign language? Yeah, let's do it. A couple of other things I'll quickly touch on that I had in my notes. Um, with the masks, at the moment, we all have to wear the masks. Now, you know, that is really hard to lip read. Deaf people, lip reading is 70% guesswork, but lip reading shows the whole facial expression and it makes it easier. So when you talk this away, it makes it so much harder for them. So when you are with a person that is deaf, still keep your distance, but pull your mask down just while you're talking to them. It makes it so much easier. So, look, if do you have a bit more time to go through some of those um silly questions um yeah, i've got all the uh, time you want. oh okay because i there's about 60 people watching i think we can keep going we've got some time but yes we will do some sign language in a bit and obviously um this will be recorded so a few questions that we have is if i speak louder or these are questions you have given me that common questions that you get if i speak louder or clearer won't they just understand me all right just the other day i received a phone call from a cat, but they wanted to do an assessment of an elderly woman. And I said, yeah, you'll need to get an interpreter. And she's like, oh, can't you just go along? And I was like, well, how about you come and clean my house for free and I'll come along and do this for free? And she's like, oh, well, interpreters are expensive. I was like, you're a government organisation. This is the clients. This is their, their human rights. Anyway, she said, oh, well, look, can we just speak to this lady? And I was like, uh, no, this lady is deaf. She cannot hear and she doesn't speak. All right, well, can you ask her to call us back? And I'm like, where is the closest brick wall? Because I'm going to headbutt it. I've just told you she is deaf. And then she said, I said to look, you can send me a text message and I will then send it to her because she doesn't have a phone, but I'll send it to her through FaceTime Messenger. But she can't connect up with through FaceTime Messenger because it's a government organisation. So she sent me a message and she said, hello, client's name. If I speak louder and clear, will you understand me when we do this assessment? Mm. And I rang back and I said, can I give you some feedback? And I was like, do you do you even listen to what I've just said? So speaking louder and clear, clearer, no. Some of the problems is background noise. Um, when deaf people wear hearing aids or cochlear implants, the background noise gets amplified. So they've got all this noise going on in their head. So it's really hard to decipher who's speaking. So that's another issue, background noise. Mm. Um, Another, one of the things, mm. sorry, one of the things I find really funny, um, some people out of trying to be helpful speak like this. So my daughter's deaf and she was at school and um, a teacher came up and she said, hello, how are you? And my daughter looked at me and she goes, mum, what's wrong with them? And I said, they're trying to communicate with you. She said, well, why are they talking to me like that? And I said, because they think that it's going to be easier for you to understand. She said, Mum, all I see is someone that's going. So, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny where you see sometimes people, like they're not doing it to be horrible. They're just trying to communicate. But just you just need to be aware of little things, like they need to see your face. You can't kind of put your hand up over your face when you're talking. Um it is harder for them to 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 understand someone who has a lot of facial hair and a beard. Um, so how how are we doing with COVID? So a lot of the times we cannot take our masks off. So what challenges have you experienced with that? Yeah, this makes the barrier. It just makes the uh, barriers so much harder for the deaf people because they can't understand. There was a guy at the Gold Coast Hospital the other night, and they were all instructed to wear a mask, and he was like, "I can't understand anybody." So. Mm. Um, it's really, really frustrating. I did a funeral yesterday and there was 10 deaf people there and we were allowed to take the mask off. Not the deaf people. If they're just in there watching, they had their masks on, but I was allowed to take my mask off because we're delivering an important message. And when you do this, you're taking away half of their understanding. Mm. 
Another question is, can a deaf people who are deaf read and write English? Okay, well, we've just said before that the literacy um, of deaf people is quite poor. Um, when I had a court case uh, back in 2000 for my daughter, um, some of the evidence that was put forward by Harlan Lane was that the literacy levels um, of deaf children can be about grade six in Queensland. They were saying grade 3.5. So that's like talking or putting English to a grade 3.5. Um, so yeah, they can read and write, but very, very basic. But every deaf person is not the same. Some deaf people are amazing. Some deaf people I know have better English and um, reading abilities than I do. So it really depends on the education. But Queensland education is very poor com com compared to other states. Um, and I know that. I've had a six year legal battle with the education department for my daughter. Um, so you can't expect a deaf person just to read and write English, you really need to break it down and make sure they understand it and make it visual. Mm. And the grammar is different. And you have to understand too that English is usually the second language for people um, who are deaf, that Auslan is their first language. Melissa has said, legally, you can take your mask off when it's for communication. It's one of the reasons not to wear a mask. I think what I was getting at is as um, sometimes the clinicians, the nurses, the doctors, we can't. Um, just depending on which environment. Uh, there, is, there is a clause, we were looking at it um, the other day, that it says that in Queensland Health, if you're working with a patient who is deaf and needs mm. that for communication, as long as you keep your distance, you can take your mask down while you're okay. communicating. Just ah, good to know. Um, okay, next question is... Look, we've sort of gone over this a bit, of, but what would you say are your main, main tips for working with deaf patients? And then we'll go to two more questions and then to some sign language. Just be kind. I know that nurses don't go out of the way to not be kind, but just be patient. Just remember that they're freaking out because they don't understand what's going on. So some tips are let them see your face. When you're talking to them, let them see your face. Um, be more um, visual, do everything more visually and kind of act it out or gesture. Book an interpreter. Um, so what are some other tips? Like my brain has just gone dead. I'm sure I'll have heats. And what I was thinking about doing was making um, a little PowerPoint with some tips because some, some people have given me some great information from the deaf community. So I'll put it together as a little PowerPoint and send it on to you guys and you guys can have a look. But um, mm. yeah. Okay. Um, why can't I use family or friends to interpret? Uh, look, a lot of people I know that are deaf, 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. And most of the time they get told, don't do sign language, get them a cochlear implant, make them learn to be, um, you know, speak and listen. And their families don't usually learn sign language. So sadly, a lot of deaf people's own family can't sign very well. So... It's, and, and it's also Queensland Health Policies and Procedures that you can't use family and friends to interpret. But also it's not fair to put someone in a position where they have to interpret and deliver bad news to their family members. They, they want to be there as support as a family. So you just need to do a qualified interpreter. It's like saying, why can't I use a family or a friend to, you know, be my nurse? Um, yeah. Well, you're <laughs> trained. You're trained. Very valid point um another thing that you get quite often is is braille braille is for deaf people right <laughs> yeah I, I got asked just a couple of weeks ago oh wow is it really hard to learn braille and i was like mm, i don't know and they're like but don't you know braille and i was like um no i've met a few people that know how to do braille but i've never learned um braille is not for deaf people braille, braille is for blind people so um yeah <laughs> I get, I, get all the time. I get questions like, oh, so can deaf people drive? And I'm like, yeah, actually, they're usually better drivers than hearing people. <laughs> oh, why is that? I said, it's just their ears don't work, but they're so much more observant with their eyes and they're using all their mirrors. And I remember being in the car with my mum and we'll be driving and I was driving and she said, pull over an ambulance is coming. I was like, what are you talking about? I couldn't even hear it. But she was looking in the revision mirror and she could see the lights coming up. And sure enough, mm. by the time she'd give me that information, I could then hear it. So she used to pick up on stuff quicker than I did. What would you say are some of the other common misconceptions that you've um, come across? Um, yeah, deaf people are, are not employable. <laughs> 
And I think that's hilarious because deaf people are the most loyal, dedicated people. Um, they're usually very good with like like detail. I think deaf, like there's one business on the coast here um, that employed a deaf person a few years ago and about eight years ago and was like a bit sceptical, like, oh, you know, how's it going to work? Now they've employed three deaf people and they love him. And the first guy that they've employed is now one of the supervisors. So um, you just, deaf people are actually beautiful people. You just got to understand that they just do things slightly differently because their ears don't work. But it doesn't mean that everything else isn't working. Mm. Okay, um, do you want to jump into some sign language? Yeah, cool. All right, so I thought I'd teach you some signs. So the sign for nurse, I can't see you guys, so you guys will have to do it behind the screen. So nurse is this. Now, why do you think that's nurse? Because back in the day, the nurses used to wear the little hats with the little crosses on it, you know, the little nurses' hats? Mm. All right, so then the sign for tablet it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Tablet is just tablet. It's like you're just picking up a tablet and putting it in your mouth. Tablet. Okay, the sign for needle. You just you do this. Oh, hang on, you do this with your hand, but you put it on your needle. It can be wherever you're putting it. The needle can be in your mouth, in your arm, in your leg, wherever. Ambulance. So. That's a sign for ambulance. So that's the top of the ambulance and the siren. Emergency. Well, this is a sign for bad. And then when you do this, you're waving two bads in front of someone's face. That's like emergency. Mm. Emergency. Okay. And maybe in comments for these couples, see if you can work it out. What's this one? Well, what do you think it is? I'm going to put the pressure on you, Jackson. <laughs> Everybody help me out here from the comments. Um, Think about it. If you hit your finger, you go, yeah, so what's okay. that? Um, pain. 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 Yeah. What's this one? We've got some comments coming through. Great. Um, sick. Feel. No. So this is sick. Sick has actually got a quite a few. It can be sick, sick, sick. So this is ache. Ah, uh, pain. Jay and Ellie saying pain. So pain. That's pain. So this one's ache. Ah, oh, there's Carol. That's Carol. That's that's Carol that we had in the rural Brisbane hospital. She's watching. Hi, Carol. <laughs> All the nurses are here learning for you, so that you don't have to experience the same again. Oh, she'll be crying. She'll be. She'll ring me after this. Oh, that's so beautiful. So ache. So toothache, headache. It just depends where the ache is. Okay, what's this? I've been saying all night you need to get an... Interpreter? Interpreter. So two hands like that. Do it, do it, Jackson. Pick it on you. Yep. Interpreter. Interpreter. Uh-huh. Yeah. So if you see a deaf person doing, can you call an interpreter? That's it, Maddie. It's an interpreter. Yeah, Ellie, they're on fire. Look at them. And come and work with us. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet the nurses. That's Carol, the one that we just saved her life. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Carol, for joining. I Can you tell her that? Jackson said, thank you so much for joining us. I've been telling them your story. I told them about today and what happened at the hospital again, and we're just like, all right. Um, um, Jay Schmidt says, Gail, is it possible to have some sort of some something with these signs? Have some sort something with these signs. What do you do mean? Do you mind? Yeah, maybe just type your question again. Um, some sort of hard copy. There you go. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, look, you can buy. We sell here at Ausland Journey dictionaries, right? So we have this dictionary, the Ausland Dictionary. And they're $95 and it's got a whole heap of stuff in there, all the signs. Wow. So we sell those. Then we also made with Bilby, like a really good contact of mine, we made a little first aid dictionary. These are $9 and they've got a whole heap of little phrases, questions, symptoms, 
Amazing. I'm going to um, pop the links up to all this. Um, I'll yeah. get them from you. And that, but the best thing is if you've got their Yay. apps on your phone, there are apps like um, uh, I'll, I'll find out the names of them and I'll send them to you, Jackson. Um, to, <laughs> they'll be sold out after tonight. No, don't worry. We've got heaps. Um, there are apps on your phone that are amazing and you can type in the word and then it will show you in a video how the sign moves because imagine a sign for um, – allergic allergic mm. she said number one first aid book she loves the first aid book allergic. <laughs> carol, carol stop taking over you should be here with me and teaching you should be right oh, hang on, on this side i'd love you guys to meet carol she's so beautiful okay allergic oh one finger yep yep so it's like a reaction and it's like a cross at the same That's time it's a really important one everyone <laughs> Um, yeah. I will send you a link, Jackson, remind me to a little short film um, about a lady who was involved in a car accident and they were about to give her some medication but no one had asked her and they had a friend interpreting and then her friend said, oh, by the way, she's allergic to and they were just about to give her this drug. Mm. Um, and then there's another little one that I'd love to share with you to watch and it makes me cry every time I watch it about a guy that I think was in a car accident as well and um, he was, he, when he woke up, he was in shock and there was all these people standing around him and he was throwing himself around the bed and they were trying to hold him down because if they didn't, he was going to damage his spine and then probably never walk again. But they're all yelling at him to stop moving and he couldn't understand. And because they clamped his hands down, that's what you do not do. If you ever have a situation in an emergency or, or when a client is getting agitated, do not hold their hands down because that's like gagging them and they will mm. get very, very agitated. It happened the other day. The police held this guy's hands, or not the police, the friends held this guy's hands down because they were worried that he was lashing out. But what they were doing was actually making him even more angry because they were taking away his ability to communicate. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, and like I said, I, I know that I keep saying Auslan Journey Facebook, go on there. And then send me a message and say, hey, Gail, I work in the cardiac ward. Can you teach me all the signs for this? Gail, I'm a maternity um, nurse. Can you teach me all the signs for? And what's this one? So it's baby. Breastfeeding. Breastfeeding. Okay, what's this one? So I'll just remove this thing off the screen so I can Sorry. see your bottom hand. Hang so on one some second. People, some people can't breastfeed, so they have to use her. Yeah, a bottle. A bottle. A bottle feed, so, yeah. You know what, guys? I just want you nurses to be able to do whatever you can within your capacity without the training to make that these deaf clients because, you know what, it'll be my mum in there one day or my dad or my granddaughter or all the 32 people in my family and the deaf community are like my family and I'm so sad to see them suffer all the time for such simple things. So join the page. Um and then send me a message. I've had a paramedic that I worked with at a um, camp and she asked me a whole, just send me the words you want and I'll show you in a video. It's better than the book because in the video you can see how the sign moves. Um, what? Also, sorry? Mm, we should we should do that. We should collect a, May, a long list of words and then we can do something like this where we just you know do a full session. Do, we could mm. actually have the nurse break Instagram page just for Auslan signs. You could set up a dedicated nurse break page that we can put up a lot of different signs and I'll get the deaf community across Australia. They'll love it. They'll do it for nothing and teach you guys just some basic signs or we can set up an Instagram page where you can just go on there for free and it's a better platform because you can see how the sign moves. When you look at the pictures, these are great. If some people like hard copy, but you've got to work out how it moves like it's, like you can see here, camera, and then it's got the little arrow going down. So this is a sign for camera. So it's like you're holding it and then you click it. Mm. So it's easier to see the sign actually done than it is to look at it in a book. But some people love the book. But, yeah. Like I said, okay. you, you use the any page. Send me the list. Tell me what signs you want to know and... Um, I'll type it in right now. Okay, what's this sign? Can anyone work it out? 
So imagine they've had a bit of a knock to the head and you've picked them up and they're feeling a bit, love it, dizzy, dizzy. Look at these people. These are awesome. Okay, what's this one? Ah. It's on your um, arm. Yeah, you everybody got, type your comments in what you think it is. Yeah, because Jackson doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so blood normally, pressure. yes, blood pressure. Right, blood guys. Pressure. Very good. Okay, what's this one? Tanya. Hey, Tanya. Tanya's a nurse up in uh, North Queensland and she's got three deaf children and I've taught them sign language. All my friends are on here. Hey, guys. So this is, what's this one? Something to do with your... Like ch chest pain? Mm, yeah. But what happens when you have chest pain? You have a heart attack. You know, Narelle, I'm pretty sure that you're a deaf person. I'm going to have a look after. I'm going to stalk you and you're telling them all... Yeah, heart attack. Yeah, all the deafies are coming on here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's this one? Hmm. I'll tell you, it's a new sign that's only come out in the last couple of years. Yeah, it is chest pain, heart attack, yeah. A new sign that's come out recently because it's only something new-ish. We've had it for a couple of years now and it keeps putting us in lockdown. You know the little cell with all the little things? Coronavirus. Oh, virus, virus. Well, that's spread. Uh, okay, cool. I just wanted to show you a couple of little signs. So when you meet someone, even if you just remember this, hello, how are you? How are you? So it's flat hands on the chest and then comes out to good. Yeah. So hello, how are you? I'll record these again and I'll put them up on the Auslan Journey page so you can watch them again and again. The alphabet, I'll do that on there because that'll take a bit of time. Then name, it's like two fingers on your forehead and then your thumb's kind of underneath. Name. Name. So then you would say my name. And then once you've learned the alphabet, let's do let's pick on Jackson is J. See you do it. J A C K S. Two little fingers hugging each other. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> S O N. So, yeah, so this is A-E-I-O-U. I'll do a little video and send it to you guys. But you'd say, hello, how are you? My name is Jackson. Do it that fast. <laughs> yeah. um, and then you can say to them, you name what? Or what's your name? Uh -huh. So nice. So nice. Okay, one thing I did notice I'm going to sign this and speak at the same time, which you shouldn't do because they're two different languages, but I have learned how to do it. But I know Carol is still watching. One thing that um, I just thought of then is when the nurse comes in, no, it's not Jason, it's Jackson. Wrong name, Carol. Just <laughs> Jason. Um, so one thing is when the nurse comes in, it's just nice to say, hi, my name is whatever or hi, Carol, or whatever. This one was cranky because I don't know why. Um, and she just grabbed her hand and just pulled this and put the drip in and she said, whoops, put the drip in and did all of this. It's just so nice just to say, hi, my name is Gail. And then just go, I, and if you can't sign, just say, I'm going to change the drip for you, the drip. That's not proper sign language, what I just did then, but it makes sense to the deaf person. They've lived it their whole life. They're so used to it. It's better than just grabbing their hand and pulling it out. And I end up jumping up and saying, whoa, 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 ease up, introduce yourself and tell her what you're doing. How do you sign? I don't understand. Okay. So go slow. Can, hang on, I'll stand up. So go slow. Slow. 
So go slow. I don't understand. That's like the brain's being flicked on. Understand. So go slow. I don't understand. Or something to let so them know. Can you say that again? So say I don't understand. What happens, right? Yeah. If you can sign, hi, how are you? My name's Jackson. Uh -huh. They go, how are you? And you're like going, whoa, oh, oh, I just know a phrase. And they do. They get excited because they've found someone that can communicate with them. So then you just go, whoa, go slow. I'm learning. Or I'm a learner. No, just joking. That says loser. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm learning. And then just say, I don't understand. Or if you're asking them, one thing you need to do with deaf people is make sure they understand. They want to understand, but a lot of the time deaf nod is very common. They just go, yep, 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 yep. And then I say afterwards, what's that about? And they're like, I don't know. So just say, do you understand? Is it good? Um, then a nice little thing to say is I'm here to help. It makes sense, doesn't it? I'm here to help. Mm, that's a good one. Stay calm. So just going down your chest. Just stay, stay, stay calm or stay patient. It's all good. I've called an interpreter. They will love you if you do that. If you want to know where's the pain, do you remember the sign we did for pain before? Pain? Yes, uh, yep. So you just go, where is the pain? That's an important one to ask them because sometimes the interpreter hasn't got there yet and you're trying to assess them and ask them where's the pain. So where is the pain? And then are you allergic to what or to what? Are you allergic to anything? Yes. Yeah. I'll um, mm. meet me on the other end. I'm happy to come back and do this again. I'm actually happy to bring some deaf people in so you can meet them. Um, they can tell you their own personal stories. Um, but it's also really nice to 1 to 10, what she's saying. So you're talking about the pain. Yeah, Carol must have come in late. One of the things that she didn't understand in the hospital was the pain 1 to 10. So we had to explain that the pain, 0, means no pain. 5, it's okay. 10, it's like, ah, it's terrible. And then they have to tell you what it is on the scale. One of the other things with Carol's experience that we saw was the nurse The nurse had come in and given her the, the buzzer that you press, which is for the um, pain relief. And so she had said, oh, this is for the pain relief. And Carol's like, uh, okay. And then Carol was in pain and saying that she hasn't had any tablets for pain. So her son was there, Jesse, and he said, no, mum, that thing that you press, it lets the, the pain medicine come in and she's like oh no one told me that so then when the nurse came back in I said to the nurse why haven't you told her what this button's for she goes oh we've told her like five times what's your problem I'm like well she doesn't even know she hasn't pressed it because she thought that that button was to call the nurse and she didn't want to interfere with you guys being busy so wow. you really need to make sure they understand just so many times at the hospital with Carol's experience, they said, oh, we've told her. I was like, how? Oh, we spoke to her. She's deaf. It frustrates me just listening to you say that. <sighs> I can only imagine the frustration. <clears throat> only imagine. Yeah. So let me just think. Uh, that, that, that. Deaf nod. Yeah, look, I'm sure there's lots of other things we can talk about. But you know what I think is really important is to engage the deaf community. Um I'm happy to do this with you a little bit more for some other sessions um, or we do them on Auslan Journey, but to bring the deaf community in and let them tell you what's best for them. Um, I can tell you what I know. I work in the industry. I'm an interpreter. I have 32 deaf in my family. Um, I have deaf parents. I, I, I see all this stuff every time. But when it comes from them and how it makes them feel, um, it's got so much more of an impact. I'm just, I'm just Gail that's got a mouth that makes lots of noise, but it's good if you hear their stories. No, I think we'll, we'll continue this collaboration and it'd be great to, it sounds like, look, everyone is loving this. Um, 
look, I can just keep posting comments. There's like 60 people watching. So uh, um, look, if any more questions, feel free. Hang on, I'll just ask. Hey, Carol, we have lots and lots of nurses watching this, about 60 people. Is there anything that you want to tell me? Put it in comments. Or if you want, I'll call you on FaceTime. Let's do that. I'll show you how we call a deaf person. Yeah. Quickly, quickly. Sarah says, try waking up from surgery and fine. They have removed my hearing aids. Trying to wake me up in recovery, calling my name won't help. Mm. Exactly. Carol's hearing aids got broken by the nurse in the hospital when she took the oxygen tube off. She dropped it and then broke it. <laughs> um, okay, let's get Carol up. Let's see. Oh, she's probably... And Kaylee says, what is the sign relief for pain? Sorry, what is the sign for pain relief? So you might so have something. Tablets, tablets, less pain. Hello. Do you want to say hello to everybody? Put some lipstick on and fix up your hair. <laughs> She's like, I don't have any lipstick. All right, I'll show you. This is Carol. Can you see her? She said, I love you. That's a sign <laughs> what is it? Hey. This, I love you. I love you. That's a mere point a finger up to. Ah, uh, yes. In Australia, we say, I love you, but this is like a universal sign. Uh huh. So, what do you want me to tell them? Tell me something and I'll tell them. I'll interpret what you want to tell them. She said, Hang on, hang on. I'm just putting my. So, she's interpreting us. Sarah said, hi, Carol. All right. She's like, oh, what can I tell you? She's taking her jacket off. She's got lots to say. You have to be quick. We don't want the long story, the short one. Okay. Don't forget allergic. Allergic. That's one of her biggest fears. Uh, and then drip. And the drip gets taken off. So drip. But how did you feel? How did you feel in the hospital? Two weeks ago without an interpreter. What did it make you feel like? She said, I felt trapped. No one there was no one talking to me. There was no communication. And all the nurses were just like talking really, really fast. Like, blah, 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 blah. And when I was like, you know, obviously I was like drugged up. I couldn't read the lips anymore. Everything was like real sort of like hazy. And then the nurses were a bit pushy with forcing me to take medication. And I was like, no, I don't know what it is. Tell me what it is first. Mm. And it was the worst time was when they did my blood pressure. And then they gave me an injection. <laughs> she had no idea what it was for. And she had bruises all over her. For the blood clots and stuff. So every morning and night they kept coming in and doing it. So the, the blood pressure and the tablets is what her biggest fear was. Why were you scared of blood pressure? Blood pressure. Yeah, they'd come in every two hours when she was asleep and just wake her up and, like, it would frighten her every two hours. And then three days later they did it less, so it wasn't so bad. So what's an important message that you want to give to the nurses for the future? What can make your hospital experience better? It's really important to show that you've got the time and then I'll know and I'll understand. But then it's so hard because I get used to a nurse and then they change shifts and a different nurse comes on. I have to start all over again. Mm. I like to have the same nurse all the time, but then she leaves and then they bring a new one and I have to learn how to communicate with them and it's just like so exhausting. And then at midnight is the worst. It's hard when the lights are off and they come in and talk to me and I'm like, what? I can't see. So we have to turn all the lights on and it made me really grumpy. Uh, tablet. The tablets, they gave me the wrong ones. Okay. So. 
when they like take the tablets out of the um, packets, I don't know what it is and they're coming to give it to me. I can't see. I want to see the box so I can see the label so I know that it's safe for me, that I'm not allergic. But when they take it out and they just give it to me with a cup and the water, I don't know what it is and I'm too scared to take it. So I know I can take Endone, but if I don't have the tablet, then I if I get a reaction, then I'll start to feel funny. I need to know what the names of them are. She's showing me all of her boxes here. She can't take, uh, she's allergic to some of the tablets. And, yeah, she just, so one of the times when she was there, the nurse came in and was, like, giving her a tablet and I was in the room and she said, no, 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 what is it, what is it? And they're like, the doctor told me, just take it, hurry up. And she's like, no, what is it? And she's like, oh, she didn't want to upset the nurse, so she took the tablet and then within 15 minutes she was getting a rash and she was scratching and she was, ah, in pain. And I was just watching it all going. Hmm. And then I asked the nurse, what was it? And she told me, and I was like, we already told you that she's allergic to it. <sighs> yeah, she said in some different brands and stuff. Um, right. Kaylee's asked, is it? Just yeah, sorry, a massive thank you to have her on. It'd be great to have her own in person. I would like to meet you. So we'll say bye and you can still watch us on there. Hang on. <laughs> How do you say goodbye? Wave. Hello. <laughs> Hello, nurses. Thank you for looking up and watching Gail. And helping all of the deaf people understand how to communicate with my medication, my blood pressure, my headaches, my fear, my allergies. You know, it's really important, important to learn sign language to help. Thumbs up. Thank you, everyone. Hey, how do you feel that this was only organised because you and I were so upset about your experience? And then I put it on Facebook and Jackson saw it and contacted me and they're now all learning a little bit. So thank you to you. All the nurses around Australia have a little bit more understanding. And then you, you can help me teach them. No swear words. <laughs> all right. Yeah. She needs, she's saying she needs to see the labels on the boxes. Um, but when you just take them out of the packets, she can't see. Yeah, if the box has got no nothing on it, there's no name, I'm too scared to take it, I won't take it. When are you getting your tattoo? When are you getting your tattoo with your allergic tablets? When? She's waiting for her stomach to heal and then she's going to get a tattoo. All right. I'm going to talk to you after. I'll talk to you. I'll see you on there. She said, thank you guys for learning to communicate with me. I'm going. See ya. <laughs> so that's um, how. Look. look, that was amazing. Um, we'll have to get on to a live in the future. I've just got one more question I'm going to ask you. Um, that was just like. I'm, this makes me want to continue to do this. Um, and it was sort of a question going on from what Carol was saying. Is it helpful if we write down the names of medications before giving them or to help identify allergies or would these be words be too difficult? Like Carol just said, she likes to see the box because when you take it out, I know when the nurses come in, they're already taken out of the packaging and they've got the little bottle of little glass of water. Um, she likes to see it. Um, so, yeah. Sometimes like the name of the medication is just like a bunch of letters because some of the names of medications are pretty full on. So, yeah. yeah. And what I do, like there was one guy, okay, so quickly, quickly, there was one guy, um, he rang me on FaceTime. He was out in his backyard putting up a fence. He was working really hard, digging post holes and stuff, and then his heart started racing really fast and um, he was sweating and shaking and he thought he was having a heart attack. So he panicked. So he called me as an interpreter and said, can you please call an ambulance? So I called an ambulance and then got the ambulance to come out and pick him up. And then I said to the ambulance, can you tell me which hospital you're taking him to um, and tell him to get an interpreter? 
Well, I didn't hear anything and I couldn't contact him. And every time I was texting him, I was hearing nothing back because he was in a hospital and lost all his um, phone service. He couldn't use his phone. So now he presented to the hospital and told them that he needed an interpreter um, and gave them the card. What we've been trying to do is get deaf people to have a little card that says, I am deaf, I need an interpreter, please call this number. Mm. It makes the process for you nurses and the admin so much quicker that they can just go, oh, okay, and that's the number to ring rather than going to try and follow your policies and procedures um, to work out how to do it because it's not something that you do every day. Um, anyway, he was in hospital. Three days later he contacted me and he said, um, oh, Gail, I finally got some phone service. Um, I had a heart attack. And I was like, oh, I, are you okay? Have they had an interpreter there? He said, no. I said, can you put me on the phone to the doctor, please? So the doctor, he called the doctor in and the doctor came in. I said, look, he's deaf. He's just had a heart attack. You need to get an interpreter in. You need to tell him what's going on. He They go, he didn't have a heart attack. And I was like, I beg your pardon? No, he didn't have a heart attack. He took all the wrong tablets at all the wrong time. He couldn't remember which tablet was for what. So he just went, oh, well, I'll just take them all this morning. And he mm. had a reaction to taking all this medication. So this, then I said, right, that's it. I'm coming up to the hospital. So I walked in to interpret. So the heart palpitations, the sweats and all the symptoms that he thought was a heart attack and he thought that's what they were saying because the doctor was Indian and he couldn't understand his accent. It wasn't a heart attack. It was just that he'd overdosed. So the simple solution is get him a Webster pack and put all the tablets in so he knows because he can't, because when I say to him what tablets that, he goes, I don't know, the little white one. I'm like, they're all bloody white. Which white one? Um, mm. So that. And then there was another case um, of a deaf guy that went along to the hospital and um, no interpreter and he came out of the hospital and then he contacted me about three days later and he was just distressed and he said, I'm going to die soon. And I said, what? He goes, I've got cancer. I'm going to die soon. I've got cancer in my brain. And I said, well, how long have you got to live? And he goes, oh, probably three weeks. And I was like, really? So then um, I rang his sister and he didn't have cancer. She didn't know. We ended up having to go and see his GP and go back to the hospital. It, it was he what he had lip read was that he had cancer, didn't even have cancer. So for three or four days, he was living with this life sentence. His life was going to end and it wasn't even the case. It's just un, it's just wasted anxiety and stress on someone that's not required. Just give them sign language. Give them the language that they understand. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight, Gail. It has been no, no. eye-opening to say the least. Um, and the amount of comments coming through sort of proves that. I have just put in the comments, guys. Let me, some let me just say something. If there's any deaf people watching, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn my voice off for the hearing people so you can see what it feels like. So, okay, now I'm going to tell you something really scary, okay? What am I saying, Jackson? Not sure. Was it a bit frustrating? Yeah. Imagine that you're laying there in pain and you're trying to tell. So that's what it's like for a deaf person when I'm not saying that the nurses don't care and the doctors don't care. You all are beautiful, but you've got to make it accessible. So that's like someone coming up and going, yeah, call the ambo as soon as possible. Carol's on fire. She's actually probably <laughs> so excited that you guys are doing this. But, um, yeah, just... um. Look, there's so much. It's 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 not hard. It's just we just got to fix the process up. And if you guys can do your bit on the ground floor just to keep the client smiling, happy, and calm, then we're already better off than what we were last week. Um, and so people can find you on. You want to say your links again and where people can contact I'm you. Plan journey. So you just go onto Facebook, and it's A U S L A N. Journey, J O U R N E Y. Um, I'll give you my email address. This 
is something that I'm doing, especially for the nurses, paramedics and people that work within hospitals. Um, I am going to start doing when Facebook unblocks me because they've blocked me from speaking out a little bit lately. Um, I've got to work out how to um, be allowed to speak again. Um, but I am going to do a live session once a week for the nurses and it's just going to be all medical signs. And we'll do that. We'll do that for about eight weeks. So it'll cost you guys nothing. It's one hour a week where I can sit here and teach you guys. It's you can ask questions as well, but it's more about just teaching you guys some sign language. And I'll be using deaf people. I've already got a whole team of deaf people that are excited to come in and do it with me. Um, because usually when you learn sign language, to learn from someone who is native or deaf themselves is the best way. Um, so my, my, if you're interested in signing up to that, my email address is Auslan Journey, so A-U-S-L-A-N-J-O-U-R-N-E-Y at gmail.com. I've already got heaps of emails from all of the nurses so far that want to do it, and I've just been collecting all of the names, and then they'll do a post out to let you know um, when we're starting. But it, It'll be something that will be recorded so you don't actually have to watch it live. I know you guys, you know, work crazy hours and all over the place. So it'll be there for when you come home in a couple of days' time, have a cup of tea and sit down and watch it. And we're just going to do an hour session and but do them every week. <clears throat> Sounds amazing. Um, I'll put all the links and including the links to the books and so on. And um, let's keep chatting about how we can collaborate and make this even better, but thanks again for everyone who's been watching. There's been six, there's still 60 of you. So, um, does anyone have any questions? And this will be interesting actually. If you are deaf, put up a comment now to say yes. I want to see how many deaf people are just watching. So, if you're deaf, and you're watching this because you're interested, put yes. Thanks, Amy. Mental health. Oh, mental health is a big issue. It's one I'm really passionate about, um, obviously, because the research shows mental health is very, very high within the deaf community because they're so isolated and they can't communicate. And they and a lot of we're really lucky here that we've got uh, three that I know of in Australia, psychologists and counsellors that specialise in deaf. And that's really important because there's nothing more frustrating than a deaf person going in to talk about their frustration and then they go, oh, just get a cochlear implant, you'll be right. And you walk out even more frustrated. So mental health's really high within the deaf community. Okay, so two, three, four. D Stephen, hey Stephen, five. Sarah, hard of hearing, six, Kim, seven. Eight. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Stephen Buckley, ha ha, crazy deaf bird. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Buckley is a deaf guy who's been very supportive of me. Emergency nurse, thank you so much. No problems, Amy. Um, Stephen Buckley is a deaf guy who's been very supportive of me and looking after me because the last few weeks, what I witnessed was very traumatic. So wow. I've been trying to deal with it. And then just trying to advocate with the um, government and the hospitals is not easy. It has worn me out. So tonight I might look okay because I brushed my hair, but the last few days I've just been worn out with what's been happening. Um, we've been keeping a record. So at the moment my Auslan journey page is full of all of these blurt, 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 complaints, complaints, complaints of what's happening. Normally it's not like that. We're hoping that it eases up and then we can go back to just being positive and fun and teaching still. But we might even get Stephen to come. He's got some wonderful stories to tell about his experiences in hospital and um, he can probably come next week or whenever. We'll organise something. Yeah, let's do it. I'm keen. Um, yeah, I'm, the, I'm sure there'll be more. Oh, hang on, whatever you're going to say, Jackson, I'll interpret for these so that the deaf here can see what you're saying. So. Sure. Um, for everyone who has never watched before, all our previous live Q&As and classes such as tonight's can be found on the Nurse Break website, www.thenursebreak.org. And I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Gail for coming on tonight and helping advocate and helping nurses advocate for our patients 
who are deaf. And um, if everyone could share, tag a colleague, a nurse, a doctor, a paramedic, um, or someone you think would find this interesting tonight's session, then we can spread the word and more people can learn about it. We can advocate for those who are deaf. And Zach Jackson, thank you so much from myself and from the deaf community. We really appreciate that you guys take the time out in your own time to try and understand the deaf world and how to make it more accessible. No, you're welcome. Thank you so much for um, helping make this a reality. Um, I think we'll leave it there. And um, thank you once again to everybody. You can watch this live as a podcast. Um, sorry, you can watch the, yeah tonight's episode as a podcast or you can watch this back as well just by heading to the website and the YouTube page and Facebook. Thanks, guys.